And, and I'll start by just moving to approve the minutes of our last meeting. OK, oh. wait one second, John. One second. Sorry, I appreciate the, the enthusiasm, but I got to I got to read something before we start. Oh. So uh, the regular meeting of the Lindale Lake Special Service District Advisory Board will now begin. Good morning. My name is Michael McLaughlin. I will be facilitating this meeting of the Lindale Lake Special Service District Advisory Board. Before we begin, I'd like to note that this meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. I will now call this meeting to order and call the roll so that we may verify the presence of a quorum. Advisory board members, when I call your name, please indicate that you are present. Stu Ackerberg. Is not present. Um, Denise. Here. Uh, oh, Jesus. Uh, thank you. Uh, Christina Lee. Not present. Um, Stu, we're doing attendance roll call. Um, I think you are back on. If you uh, I am present, you are present. Thank you. John Megan. Yes, sir. Here. Is present. Cole Rogers is not present. So uh, there being three advisory board members, uh, we do have a quorum and can proceed with the meeting. Um, oh, Christina's here. Oh, very good. Christina. Hi good morning, there. Christina. Um, Hi, Christina. Hi. <laughs> Hope note everyone's you, doing well. Thanks. We will note that you are in attendance as well. So we have four board members present. Um, uh, I'm also joined by Andrew Carlson uh, and David Bauer with Public Works. Um, and it does not appear that any other members of the public have joined us at this point. Um, there being a quorum of advisory board members present, we will proceed um, and uh, adoption of the agenda and the minutes um, are the first uh, item up on the agenda. We can uh, do both in one action. Um, and John, I think you were eager to make a motion. So moved. There a second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion to adopt today's agenda, draft agenda and uh, adopt the minutes to the prior meeting? Uh, therefore, I will call the roll of uh, Stu Ackerberg on the motion. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Approved. I'm sorry. Very good. Denise. Approved. Yeah. This is on the motion. I said approve. I don't know if you heard it. Yeah, uh, Denise, I heard you. Christina, you're on mute. Approve. Very good. Sorry, it Just needs to approved. be heard and seen on the video to be official. And John Megan. Approve. Rogers is not present. Uh, that action is taken. Um, we are, have not been joined by any in the public, so we will uh, we can delay the public comment period till the end of the agenda. Um, the uh, if anyone does attend and would like to address the board, uh, we'll move on uh, very quickly to the 20, a very quick review of the 2021 uh, work plan. This was previously sent to you. Uh, we kind of covered this new format a year ago, um, so I'll maybe just hit the highlights of uh, we did a, again a detailed version of the summary of services. So this was um, all highlighted in terms of the total amount of snow that fell. Uh, the number of instances of graffiti that were removed, which was over 1,600 over the course of the year, the number of bags of trash uh, removed as part of the pan and broom, uh, which was 245 bags of trash that was not uh, on the, the streets of your district that otherwise would have been. Uh, we did a seasonal cleanup, uh, seasonal lighting. Uh, we lit 177 trees um, and maintained them along with the electrical system. Um, and we can talk about a few uh, remaining items with that as we get into the 2022 work plan. Uh, streetscape, of course, we maintain all the landscaping and watered um, all the, the, the planting beds um, and emptied your 36 trash receptacles uh, all over 3,600 times over the course of the year. Um, financial, I will note, um, uh, this is a slightly different financial th than what I had reported in the email two two weeks ago. Um, the actual surplus is twenty two thousand four hundred forty three. We originally had a slightly higher number. We realized there was one line item that had been omitted uh, when we had done the earlier version. So this is the true and correct version, and it has been verified. 
um, and you will see this reflected in the revised budget um, in just a moment. Any questions on the 2021 annual report? Otherwise, we'll move on. You you don't list anything about how many banners had to be replaced as part of the. You know, you counted the garbage bags. What, are we keeping an eye on where we're at with banners? Yes. Okay. Uh, we actually have the, the the vendor report that out to us so we know how many we have in inventory so that when we get near low, we can just automatically reorder them. Excellent. We can, I think, definitely easily report that back to you. Um, absolutely. And and the and the vendor was spoken to about the amount of ice that they were splaying out on the streets during the early part of the snow season. Uh, we, we did have a conversation with the vendor about the, the de-icing to make sure that they are in compliance with the specifications, and uh, yes. Okay, because they were not in compliance. You know, that was pretty obvious. We looked like the Sahara Desert of salt and sand on the sidewalks after some of the major, uh, not even so major events, so good. Um, anything else on the annual report? Okay, we can move on to the 2022 uh, work plan. Um, so this is your revised budget. So again, this has the the adjustment column is the uh, represents the surplus from year end 2021. Um, so it's 22,443 uh, for placeholder purposes, um, consistent with what we've done in the past, those dollars were allocated to your snow services line item. Um, but please know those dollars can be allocated to any of these other uh, line items in, in your budget. Um, the um, uh, so your amended budget. Um, uh, is now for this year uh, for 2022 is 197,443, and we always like to make clear this: the surplus obviously are dollars from a prior year, so it does not change the service charges imposed this year. That still stays exactly at the level that the advisory board recommended um, a year ago, which was 175,000 um, dollars. We uh, the plan is to to. Fulfill the the normal work plan as we have done in the past. Uh, we do want to hit some highlights, though, of, of a few things, and we can talk about anything the group would like. Um, first, let's start with the hanging uh, basket program. Um, we um, uh, a couple. We just wanted to highlight sort of where we're at. So, uh, as you'll recall, a year ago the discussion was to order and install um, uh, 30 uh, plant pole planters. What we're calling pole planters. Um, uh, meaning on 30 different light poles. So we have developed this uh, deployment plan, which places at least one uh, pole planter hanging basket on uh, one per block face, at least one per block face uh, on the short the short blocks, um, and then the block faces, I should say, and then uh, some additional ones on the longer block faces. So. Um, this certainly seemed equitable uh, to us to disperse the benefits since all of the property owners within the district are, are paying. Um, so all the all the planters and the liners have been delivered and they are at our ven at the vendor. Um, so they everything is 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 in 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 the house, if you will. Um, we developed a planting plan, um, recognizing the reality of your district. There are some locations that uh, on the on the south side of Lake Street that were going to be shady almost all of the day. Um, so we identified, uh, basically came up with a sun location plan and a shade location plan to um, encourage the plant plants that are more shade tolerant in the shady uh, locations. And you see those indicated by the the little blue markers uh, here. Um, so uh, in total, we've ordered over 660 plants, which is approximately 22 per planter, so 22 per pole. Um, those that were ordered um, back in January, um, and we, as typical, we, you know, we usually take delivery sometime the third, fourth week of May, depending on the weather and when the nurseries are, are ready to ship their product. So 
please know that everything is is on order. Um, the um, the uh, we did um, uh, we did quite a bit of research on trying to figure out um, learn from other communities that we thought had successful hanging basket programs. We contacted those communities to find out exactly what they planted and what their maintenance approach was beyond just watering as needed. Um, so please know that we we did quite a bit of work on this to to try to have this be as successful as successful a program as possible. Uh, and based on that, uh, we came up with a, a plant palette of petunia, a variety of things. I've just listed a few here. So it's both flowering plants as well as trailing plants, so that there really is a good visual impact. Um, you know, certainly this can evolve over time, over the years as you have these. Um, so just because we're doing this year one, if we find something doesn't grow very well, uh, we we can certainly mix it up uh, in, in future seasons. Uh, for maintenance, uh, we expect that we'll need to water them daily or as needed. If we do, if we go into a rainy period, maybe we won't need to water them daily. So it won't be automatic, um, but it will, will be prepared to if needed. Um, to make sure that the, the, the plant health of the plants, is, that they stay viable. Um, and that um, based on our best practice research, uh, fertilizing at least every three weeks uh, tends to encourage the most growth. Um, so being hanging baskets, the nutrients tend to, to flow out of them um, rather quickly uh, because of the, the growing medium. Um, we also in January did a test. So this is down in, in um, on Lake Street. You can see Christina's shop back here in the background, um, but we actually did a test with the bucket trucks and uh, we just wanted to make sure before we, you know, you know, basically suss out if there were any issues we needed to know now or wanted to know now in terms of installation. We did learn a few things and uh, we have, are going to make a few, not modifications to the planter, but um, the technique in terms of how we put them up on the pole when the plants um, are ready and we can install these. So please know that we also did a did a trial. This We took this down right away, so this is not out there. You would not see this if you went out there uh, today. Um, but uh, so again, just uh, wanted to describe. Any questions on the, the hanging basket program? Congratulations, you did a beautiful job of execution here so far. Thank you. Yep, I echo that. Thank you. Great. Um, moving on. Um, so again, right now, third, fourth week of May is typically depending on, um, you know, we certainly if there's a risk of frost, we're not going to put anything out there. So that really is the big determinant because we obviously wouldn't want to put all this investment out there and have it have it all um, freeze up on. Us. So um, moving on into other back to 2022 budget and work plan. Uh, Streetscape uh, maintenance, since we last met, as we described to you a year ago, uh, the, your streetscape maintenance contract was rebid, um, and the pricing stayed uh, pretty flat, and in some cases actually went down. Um, so uh, we were pleased with that, which given the environment uh, of everything happening in the economy, isn't, uh, it wasn't an, a foregone conclusion. Um, we it ended up that the vendor that had the contract before the work was awarded to them again because they were the low bidder, uh, the lowest responsive and responsible uh, bidder uh, to that work. Um, the um, uh, we also uh, staying on uh, the 2022 uh, your snow contract was rebid um, and uh, we talked a little bit about it already. Um, prices there also stayed pretty flat, and in that case, the work was also ended up being awarded to the same vendor that had the work um, previously. So, the um, feedback, um, so we, we did have a question. The way these contracts are set up is that they are um, uh, annual in the case of streetscape and seasonal in the case of snow services. Does the group have an opinion on um, whether to extend the snow contract for the upcoming 2022-23 winter season? So it's it's an option that the city has based on how we did the bidding. Um, so we, we can just extend it. There is a CPI um, uh, it, that increases the, the that would uh, increase the cost. Um, or we can go back out to bid. Um, 
Well, the only you know feedback that I got about it was that the there's supposed to be a a cap on the annual revenue of the corporation that gets these projects. And that cap I was told was like $3 million. And the company that did get the, the low bid is actually part of a much larger than that company. And so the previous contractor kind of felt like there had been some sleight of hand in who the award was given to uh, because of that qualification. Have you heard this before? Uh, y yes, uh, we know what uh, the the vendor that the work was awarded to was determined by the city's finance department to qualify for the program under which the work was bid. So the question was asked and answered by the finance department, John. OK, that's it. Um, so. As far as we know, they qualify. Okay. How, many, how many years have they worked on our project? One. Just yeah, I was going to say, I think I missed just, I just misspoke. The streetscape contract went to the same bidder. The snow services went to a new bidder. Um, this, this was they're the not first. one and the same? No, we, there's two different contracts. Sorry, with 15 districts, uh, we, we had a lot of things happen this year. So you had a, there was a different snow vendor for the prior winter season. This is a new snow vendor and it, it which is the background of uh, with what John was just saying there. There was a question about the, um, the, the eligibility of the vendor that the work was awarded to. And again, we confirmed with finance or we asked the question of finance if they qualified and they, they were told they did. So the work, the contract went forward and the work was awarded to them. And nobody uh, challenged it. The, Correct. Yeah, there was there was conversation. I mean, uh, we have no reason to believe that that decision was incorrect, so. OK. Uh, thoughts again on uh, extend or not to extend? I feel they did a competent job. Helpful. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, Michael, do you have any thoughts of, of, I mean, how this, if we went to a new vendor, how that cost might compare with going with the second year of this contract? Um, this, I will, and I'm saying this from memory, but your pricing was really close. So if that were to hold, I would say there, and Andy and David are going to correct my memory here, uh, but uh, I, I remember this being a very slim margin of difference. We had two bidders for the snow contracts uh, for, for the districts, um, and they were, for the most part, pretty close in a lot of the districts. Um, so if that pricing were to hold, it would not, and if we were to get similar type of pricing, I, I, I feel comfortable saying that we wouldn't expect to see a big increase. Um, this was also bid out six months ago and the economy has changed. So, uh, you know, yeah. caveats all over that. I, Christine, I think, what were you going to say? Yeah, I think because they've done one year and they've done a good job um, and I'll, it would be um, like they wouldn't, you know, a, a new group wouldn't have to learn all the routes and all that, uh, that stuff. And then if we went to rebid again, it may be really high because of the condition of our economy right now. So I think gas prices going up and et cetera. So I think we're better off sticking with the same extension. For well, they didn't have a real hard year to deal with. You know, they had less than normal snowfall and the way that the snow fell wasn't going to stress anybody the way it appeared to me for our snow. If we had had a different kind of a year when we got 24 inches on the ground all at once, maybe the performance wouldn't have got such a high rating. But I agree, you know, even though it's a slim margin, if the city believe and, and did not our snow contractor end up getting many other of the contracts in the city on special services? Correct. Yes. Yes. That's so, not unusual, but um, yes, they they have uh, they have multiple districts that they service that they were awarded work. 
So it sounds like there's consensus to to extend the then existing one contract for, for at least another season. We'll have another conversation a year from now and see how season two goes. Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Very good. Um, the uh, as we typically do, we'll be doing a, a walkthrough of the district here with the spring. Um, uh, to, to note any items, we, we have had a number separate from that, though, please know that there have been a number of reported damage uh, things, items of damage that have been reported to us that we have already in queue. So they didn't wait for a walkthrough, to be clear. Um, and very quickly, so uh, Denise, thank you for the, uh, the heads up on the damage to, to your fence column. Christina had contacted us um, that there was some damage at, at her uh, location um, that we have already got a, a work order and process in place. We also had a car accident. Oh, go ahead, Christina. You you guys did a fantastic job fixing that pole right away. I was so impressed on how fast the crew came right after we mentioned that. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, appreciate the feedback. Um, we also had a, um, uh, on the south side, on the, the 200 block, uh, on the south side of, of Lake Street, we had a, a motor vehicle uh, accident that took out one of the trash receptacles um, that we, um, uh, after doing the, a quick analysis, we determined that it's in, in some cases where it's going to be less expensive to just repair and refinish a, a trash receptacle. We're going to do that to save the district money rather than just automatically buying a new receptacle. Um, and once we get it repowder coated, you won't be able to tell the difference, uh, to be clear. Uh, so we uh, please know that that is uh, in motion uh, already. Um, and then uh, we did have, um, and this is kind of a segue into the seasonal lighting for this year. Um, we did have a couple of uh, locations uh, where trees could not be lit this last winter season because of accidents that took out light poles which is where our circuits run through, if that makes oh. sense. So um, we don't control when the traffic light poles are repaired. So we're dependent upon the traffic <laughs> division within the city to make those repairs before we can go in and repair the circuit for the district. Uh, but please know that we're working with the traffic division and uh, our hope is that before this, this upcoming lighting season later this year, um, that we can um, get those repaired. Um, so, uh, please, you know, we were definitely tracking them, um, and they're just in the middle of winter. There's just certain things that, that couldn't be accomplished. So that's one piece. We also had a couple of, um, trees mm -hmm. that the snow, uh, mm -hmm. operator, uh, the district snow contractor mm -hmm. inadvertently damaged the, the cable, the, the, the circuit cable on the tree. Um, uh, so those are being repaired, but not at a cost to the district. Um, so. I uh, know that those made a couple of instances of those. Um, and then other repairs are um, the uh, are are uh, will be in, in motion here. And um, we did have we also have um, a couple of trees that are going to be replaced. Um, David, is that correct? Lynn Lake, because aren't there a couple of trees we're having where we have to have the electrical pullback? So the park board reached out to us, said they're going to be replacing some trees. Our protocol is we go in, pull back the electrical, the park board removes the tree, replants the tree, and then we reinstall the electrical. So know that there's a couple locations where that work is underway. Um, the, um, we want to have a conversation about seasonal lighting, but any uh, other items specifically related to maintenance uh, before we talk about uh, seasonal lighting for this coming season? Yes. Um, Please. The... As, as the streetscape has aged and the uneven level of many of the concrete portions of the sidewalk have gotten to become ginormous, to say the least, I have been on other districts along Chicago Avenue uh, and, and around big buildings where I see a technique being used as opposed to putting in asphalt patches, which are kind of ugly and disappear. They are it looks to me like they're grinding down the, the sidewalks to match. And, uh, and I don't know how that's done. I've never seen the equipment in, in action, but I, I wonder if the, if the special service districts have ever utilized this as a way to try to fix something that's, as long as you've got trees and sidewalks are gonna be popping, it's not safe. You know, people are gonna be tripping. Uh, 
And so I, I just wondered if that is something that we might assess and of course would have some influence on a, a, a placeholder in our budget if that could be done. So Educate. I'm going to interrupt just for a second here, uh, members. Um, we can uh, definitely address some of these in-season uh, services for sure, the sidewalks, the lighting and so forth. But uh, just as a quick time check, it's um, 10.55 according to my watch. Um, maybe we can postpone this part of the conversation in terms of, you know, we've got a broad sure. overview of in-service for 2022. And if we can transition to your 2023 proposed budget, just so we can ensure that uh, everybody present has a chance to weigh in on that. Uh, Thoughts is that uh, then we can come back to our conversation. Sure. I just wondered if a placeholder was appropriate. Yeah. Uh, yep. It, it, it could be if you if you wanted to allocate district resources. It is not the responsibility of the service district to make those repairs. It's a property owner responsibility for sidewalks. But if you want the district to provide that service, it can. Uh, you know, many of the ones that I see are not just the public sidewalk. It's uh, around the plantings of the district, et cetera. Are, are the property owners? Yeah, that's not the, the service owner. district doing what you're what you're seeing. That's the, a property owner doing that. Well, the problem with doing that is, is that there's probably going to be damn few property owners that are going to take it upon themselves to want to pay for those. Uh, I, I consider them safety features, you know. Yep. And, and, and uh, to Andy's point, we, we should probably, because there's two big things we still want to talk about, but uh, All right, I'll let they, it, uh, it, it can be if you wanted to, but let's come back to that in a second when we talk about 2023. <laughs> okay, let's do the 2023 right. important vote. Uh, so we can, well, we actually, we'll, we'll still have a quorum at, at, even if Stu has to leave, so just so everybody's clear. Um, all right, so uh, we included, so we'll move on to 2023 and then we want to come back to an item for this year for seasonal lighting. Or do, is that everybody okay with that or you want to stick with the, well, actually. I'm okay. Uh, Andy, we should talk about seasonal lighting first, but let's have a quick conversation about it because it's going to influence what, it may influence what you do in 2023. Here's Correct. our question for 20, uh, so I'm back on 2022. Seasonal lighting. Uh, we wanted to ask the board if you wanted to consider going with LED stringers for your holiday lights for this upcoming winter season. No. Um, the. Did you say no, John? What did you well, say? I just did quickly. Unless oh. the world has changed. Uh, so <laughs> we wanted to quickly describe what we have learned in one other district with regard to LED, two other districts, excuse me, with LED stringers. And let me preface all of this very quickly by saying you don't have to change anything. If you want incandescence, we'll order incandescence. OK, so we're not telling you you have to do it this way. We want to make sure that you guys know uh, we want to share with you our experience, which overall has been uh, pretty positive in other districts that have switched over to LEDs. OK, so um, the uh, there is a cost implication up front. The LED stringers are definitely more expensive by a factor of about 2.5. Okay, um, the the costs for installation are the same. The removal costs are a little bit higher because they need to be taken down more carefully. Um, and there are storage costs for the off season um, associated with LEDs. Um, benefits: um, what we have found so far, for the most part, is that the lifespan of a stringer is at least three season, if not more. So if the cost is 2.5, the lifespan is at least three X at this point and maybe greater, okay? Um, overall, the electrical utility costs um, are lower um, with a little bit of a caveat. And one of the things that we're seeing is significantly better performance. The LED stringers significantly What's the right syntax? We have many fewer issues with GFI faults happening with the LED stringers. So the lights stay on more consistently because water isn't intruding into them. So from an aesthetic standpoint, you have lights on more of the time of when you want lights on. Um, and we're seeing lower costs for uh, electrical, you know, the electrical contractor costs because they're not having to go out to troubleshoot as much. 
So um, again, not required to switch. Uh, it's early enough in the year right now that we feel that if you said we wanted to go LED, we could still place the order in time to get the materials in hand. So in a nutshell, the reason we're bringing this up to districts, we did a pilot in one district, expanded to another district, and so far the districts, I would say, are at least break even, if not a little money ahead, once they make the investment in LEDs. Again, not trying to convince you one way or the other, just wanted to share the knowledge that we have. Um, is it possible to uh, change one tree at a time when needed for this LED use? So say you use up every string that that you're able to use now, and then say you're missing a few, then, then you take that last tree and then you convert that whole one into an LED. Can that uh, match? It, a look? Yes, except um, like right, we remove all the lights in the spring. So it's really a question of we don't re, we can't reuse the lights. They don't the incandescence will last only one season. Oh. So so oh. what you're describing isn't really needed, Christina, because oh. we're just we either go all incandescent and then or we go all LEDs. I see. OK, I didn't know that. We, OK. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, we have visited this in years past. The, the problems that I remember and certainly witnesses is that we got a lot of vandalism. People just ripped the things apart and we, we're in trees and the uh, wraps around these LEDs because I, I put up a gigantic tree every year with LEDs. I rarely get more than one season out of them because squirrels eat them. <laughs> Corn based uh, plastic being used around those wires invites the squirrels. And then you say, God bless it, you know, I paid, unless you can get the super, I've found, you know, super cheap Chinese tiny LEDs, which I still throw away every year. If I get more than one season out of an LED, I say, wow, that's fabulous. Um, but but it is the vandalism and how many times I see the, uh, the lights are actually, they're broken by the wind. You know, that's what happens with our non-LED lights. The, the branches move, the things just snap. So, you know, conventional wisdom in the past has always said to me, get by them and say goodbye to them because in an urban environment, they don't seem to be making it here. But maybe I'm wrong. That, you know, uh, it's just well, one man's opinion. So your comment about the vandalism is, is definitely accurate. Um, I mean, we have somebody, unfortunately, that every year for the last several years has taken a machete, not to your string lights, but to your electrical supply lines on each tree um, so they uh, you know again, that's that's so we I, I would say and I, I'm not trying to convince you but just so everyone's working with good information our experience this was our fourth year on Eat Street on Nicollet and fortunately we did not experience what you described John Squirrels where did, did they get the that. power from though on those cords, are they not right. coming from above the? Yeah, the yeah, ground? yeah. So the damage, the 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 power supply is lower. That is true. That that no no challenge there. The power supply is different. The location that the power is fed to the trees is higher up in the tree because they use extension cords from their low level light poles. Exactly. So you I, can't just I, I walk just, by drunk, jump up. And, and, and rip them down. And and I put 275 feet of lights out and every year people just rip them, you know, maliciously. It, it drives me nuts here on the corner. So, um, okay. so I, I think we have I a different a environment one, and a different power member. source. Yep, okay. Other, you don't need to do this. I'm not trying to convince you one way or the other. You're all, you're all I, I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Other we experienced like between 10 and 15 percent loss due to vandalism and damage from wind and buses and people on the streets. So that's what we planned for, and that's what's got us through previous seasons for you guys, uh, with 10 to 15 percent on hand to make repairs. Okay. Denise, thoughts, Christina? Uh, I'd like to stick with what we have. I don't really want to spend more money.
I I feel uh, John's frustration, so I think I'm not frustrated. I'm no, just oh, from, I'm from that. No, no, I, I take your, your experience. <laughs> so I coming from your experience, I think it is better just to stick with the same one. We, we yeah, we probably have to replace them. Perhaps maybe in a couple of years when the economy is a little bit more stabilized and we can feel a little bit better about spending more money, that would be good. But last year we did, even though the economy was like, you know, you know, COVID panic, uh, pandemic stuff, we still spent more money doing the uh, flower hanging baskets. So, so in this case, I think I, I would probably hold back on the strings, string lights, just keep it the same for now. And we still get the effect. Thank I you. think the performance this year was excellent on our lights too. I did not see blocks with trees out all the time. It looked like they were always lit most of the time. So kudos to the contractor. Uh, that was, uh, we, we had a slightly different approach to how we handled electrical repairs this year. Um, so things were a little tighter on our end. So I'll, I'll accept that compliment on the team's behalf because uh, it, there were multiple reasons why it worked better this year. Yeah. Do so any thoughts? On Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay. Well, I'm glad you waited for you know the guy who would say we should put menorahs up. That might be a little safer. Than the last <laughs> <time stopping. laughs> I'm I'm good with the uh, with the group. It's a festival of lights. There you exactly. Go. Hey, I was down there in, uh, oh gosh, when was it? When all the lights were up, it was a Thursday evening and there's activity. And it was just so wonderful to see that all lit up because I'm out in the burbs and I talk to people and there's a lot of people that are still terrified to come into the city. Damn right. For sure. For Doesn't sure. help to have uh, incidents on our, our corner and then have the carjackings and then have people doing burnouts at like two, three in the morning. With a mob of like over 200 people there. We got to assist elderly customers to the car because we're worried about them being yeah. targeted. Well, uh, um, anything else on 2022? Otherwise, we'll move on to 2023. Okay. Good. All right. Um, included in the packet um, so was a draft, discussion purposes only, um, a budget that uh, more or less keeps your existing work plan um, and keeps the service charges flat, all very much subject to the board's discussion here. So um, I'll start with uh, I tweaked a few things. So again, every year we go back, we look at what uh, actual expenses were for the prior year, see if there's any changes that need to be made. Um, so I modified a few line items, but the overall budget of 175,000 um, would hold this does include under streetscape landscaping um, the all the maintenance of the the hanging baskets so know that we have included that we obviously uh unless you want to add more which this budget doesn't envision if you want to add more hanging baskets we would need to adjust this line item but if you want to plant a, a summer planting and a uh, winter planting of your hanging baskets that is in this budget it um i it, I kept for the, the you know seasonal lighting. Um, this assumes incandescent. It did not assume LEDs, which is why we had the conversation about LEDs before this. So these numbers still hold. Uh, snow services would still be for the 60 inches of snowfall, um, and otherwise it's the the pan and broom uh, April 1 through November 30th, the spring cleanup. You know basically our normal work path, uh, flow uh, and service levels. The one item that is not in here because we haven't had a conversation about it yet, but last summer the or the group had a very brief conversation about whether you wanted to add a uh, public safety line item to your budget. This would be the place to do it if you wish to um, add it. So um, again, all for discussion purposes, um, comments, questions on the 2023 draft budget. I like that you got all that done at the same price. <laughs> yes, and, and as far as the public safety thing, when we were pressured last year and the comment was made, why don't you take money out of, you know, remove all those lights and put it into public safety. I was very glad that we did not have that line in our budget, which prevented us from having to even consider that option. I think the city police ought to be doing their job and I hope that the violence in this 
part of town is starting to tampen down. Stu, I know that you're very active in Uptown and that you guys spend, you know, a jillion dollars on that public safety thing, but this district has never run with special services, you know, being so expansive on, you know, creating a, a much larger budget to include that. Now, I, I really would appreciate hearing from you on that particular line. Well, let's, I mean, let's be optimistic. Let's assume we don't need it. Um, it's hard to tell. I mean, we, I think we'll probably have some action this weekend, you know, with the Amir Lock situation. Yes. Uh, but, but hopefully, hopefully most of it's behind us. And I, I think we probably can't afford the kind of security we need anyway. So I would say for now, let's just keep doing what we're doing. The best thing possible is to have more eyes on the street, more people in the area, more stores open. That yes. tends to def deter the, the, the crime anyway. Um, so I, I would suggest we probably pass for now. I concur. Christina, I, I do too. Uh, yeah, I would agree too. Um, <clears throat> we we actually do, you know, did hire extra security for our business on Lake Wine and Spirits for the past two two years, I think, <clears throat> two and a half years. So I'm I'm hoping that each um, individual business would probably increase their security on their own, which is then more eyes on the street as well. Um, for our responsibility at this point, I feel like um, the best we can do is create that environment that looks safe to, mm -hmm. to encourage, you know, to encourage people to come back to the area. And um, one of my biggest pet peeve is the graffiti which I don't know how to handle yet. I don't know what to do. Um, we have, like last year, I put a mural on um, on Nicollet, spent about $800, and then this year I had to spend another 150 to paint over the, the mural itself. And um, we've been hit all over Minneapolis from our different buildings for graffiti. And it's so difficult because you take it off and then it'll come back on. So um, being in this area, we get this situation um, put upon us, you know, as land, um, property owners. So I don't know if there's a way the city can give people a break on the fees, but like still demand the changes, like demand the um, erase of graffiti, but not like fine us so much all the time because we can't keep up. I don't know what to do. And Christina, I've been dealing with that for years, years. Do you find that it's more now for sure than before more occurrences yeah but um it gets really upsetting because you know my husband's out there cleaning it right away and covering it up and then if you don't someone reports it you get a letter but then i look at graffiti on some of these boarded up buildings for like over a year and nothing happens yeah that that's my it, it's really odd there are some buildings that i've seen graffiti on all the time and we get hit by and I clean it up this and then the others are still there so then I finally end up having to apply for a mural status on some of the better um you know uh anyway paintings that had had been put on there not by not by vandalism but on purpose you know so anyway I I don't know if, as a special service district are we able to I know those are private properties, so I don't know if we can even get on that topic, right? Okay, so at, at, at least um, be thinking about finding the landlord, the property owners, maybe at a lesser amount of fees so that we can handle the situation right now because there's less police out there, more vandalism happening, so we're always getting hit by it, even though we try to clean it up or and put a, a pretty mural up there. It's still happening over the murals itself. So I, I don't know. I just want let, to let everyone, let everyone know what's kind of going on. Yeah, thank you, uh, Christine. Yeah. I, I made a note of it. I, would um, okay, I think sorry. we need to get, I need to update myself on what the rules are for graffiti removal on private property. So. Uh, if something comes out of those conversations we have with with our colleagues, um, we can report back. But we we can definitely share your story in terms of you know some of those just just the logistics and the timeliness of things. So um, I made a note just so that we can get up to speed on 
what that I mean, obviously we can speak to uh, the services we're providing in the public right away for graffiti removal, but um, I have a feeling that this meeting, will, this question will come up a lot as we meet with other boards. So um, we will look into that to see what those policies are. And if there, if there is some additional information, we can we can share that with you. Yeah, and also it happens. I would just suggest that we call a Oh yeah, in the winter time, and it, it's like way up high on the top of the building, so it's not something that we can easily access sure. to clean it up. And so all winter, you know, snowy, so it's icy, so it's hard to do in the winter time. So right. like, if they can just like hang on and and not find us during the winter, maybe that would help, because <laughs> then we can re, you know, clean it up in the summer. And then, you know, something like that would be helpful for us. <laughs> we'll let you know. Yeah. Stu, you had a question? No, I was just going to suggest, I and mean, we've, we've done murals for decades now. I wouldn't give up hope. I mean, it, it's been a tough couple of years. Uh, there were 100 plus people out here for a mirror lock. I went over that was 60, 75 days ago. They hit almost every building coming down the block. So if, if we can create some peace, if we can get the, the police department to be more respectful, more sensitive, and start to get some positive momentum. I think those murals in general tend to keep the graffiti off people's buildings, but I know it's I know it's challenging. I'm sorry you're having that experience. Thank, thank you, Stu. I'll keep hoping. <laughs> well, you know, you have these protests, and I've seen you know some of the things on Unicorn Riot, and there's people protesting, but then there's other people that take it as an opportunity to go and tag. And they have nothing, nothing absolutely to do with the pro the you know the protest. It's their opportunity. Um other just coming back to the 2023 budget, I know we want to wrap up early. Um other comments, suggestions. Otherwise, is there a motion someone would like to make to uh, adopt uh, the draft budget as the advisory board's recommended budget for 2023? Someone. I would like to pass that motion or make that motion. I second. OK, I saw Stu as a first and then John as a second. Is that appropriate? OK. okay. Uh, any further discussion on the motion to adopt this budget recommendation for 2023? Hearing none, I will call the roll on the motion to adopt the 2023 budget recommendation um, on the motion. Stu Ackerberg. Approved. Approve. Approve. Christina. Approve. John. Approve. Roll is absent. Is adopted. Uh, and as in all past years, the um, uh, there'll be public hearing in September. Um, we uh, we presume that board does is wants to have the same service charge methodology, which is service frontage. Video front services, video footage of frontage. <laughs> Let me get that out. Um, the uh, there's one final item we want to talk to the group about. Uh, Stu, I understand um, if you need to leave. If not, please stick around. This will be a short item. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just go on and turn my camera off. I just am going to walk this next spot, so I'll be silent. Good. Thank you. Good to see you, Stu. Yep. Thanks, Stu. Hi. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you all. So uh, the final thing we wanted to bring up was uh, we uh, with uh, sort of this uh, wherever we're at with COVID, I don't even want to say a lull because who knows if that's going to stay accurate, but um, with our ability to re-engage property owners, uh, we intend to do that this year, particularly with the completion of the road reconstruction between Blaisdell uh, to the east. Um, so um, as you know, we've talked about this for, for several years, um, but the, the idea of enlarging the current district, uh, which ends at Blaisdell on the east, um, to somewhere over here to be determined, should it be um, Stevens, should it be the bridge, should it be um, halfway between uh, underneath the 35W? So let, maybe less of a focus right now on that, but. Our intent is to re-engage these property owners, um, and I'm going to try to zoom in here if it'll let me, uh, to see if there is an interest in expanding the district. Um, so if there is, and to be clear, we started this conversation with these property owners Many five years, years ago. So right. um, this is not a new conversation. Um, there, you know, the project, the reconstruction project hadn't happened uh, then. 
uh, and uh, the Kmart site obviously is now completely controlled by the city. So the circumstances are, are different, uh, which may lead to a different outcome uh, than where we were at several years ago. Uh, so the, uh, the plan is to re-engage these property owners, ask them if they would like to be part of the largest service district to provide maintenance similar to what, well, exactly like what's being provided in the rest of the district. If the answer is yes, at minimum, we are hoping to have the red lines, the service lines here, again, to be determined over here. Um, one question we will be asking them, if the answer is yes to this, what about these side streets or these cross streets on these purple lines? Um, is there, a, you know, do they have an interest in having these be serviced? Because unlike the most of the other cross streets, except for Lindale in the district, um, you know, the other ones have residential, so there's no reason to service them and there's no ability to charge. There would be um, for these properties, uh, potentially, or at least a portion of what is in purple. So one question we had for this group, again, we presume for consistency, if the answer is yes, they are, want to be part of the service district, the red lines would be serviced and they would be charged for that. Does this group have any thoughts one way or the other on the purple lines? Well, there's going to be huge development south of Lake Street between Nicollet and Blaisdell. It's going to become a, a, a very large uh, yes. parcel of, of activity. So it only makes sense to ask them if, if there is a, an entity yet to be contacting, you know, a year from it, it, th then I would yep. see, you know, put the ball in their court. And the, the large property owner with the on the other side of Nicollet Avenue, you know, does he uh, have the appetite to accept that kind of an assessment because you need 70% of the property owners to to go along with this extension. But I think it's certainly worthwhile. And then would the post office be as a public entity able to participate uh, along they, first? They, they could, they would not likely. Ah, okay. They so, could, but they typically don't. And or have well, when, I, when we went out and sold our district, what we did was we kind of pre-calculated what it would cost and held yep. that number in front of people and said, this is what it would be. You know, this is sometimes the number isn't as big and scary as you think if if you went along with a bigger plan. Yeah, that's all part of the outreach, John. So thank yes. you. Um, the, my question was, does this group have an opinion? We will. We'll, it, it all depends on what this group thinks, meaning the property owners. We understand that. But if they ask, well, what does everybody else think? We wanted to ask you as the existing advisory board if you guys had an opinion on whether the purple areas should be serviced or not. If you have no opinion, that's fine. We'll, we'll defer to the, the property owners in this area. That's We just wanted to ask the question. Um, I, I'm wondering um, if we designate the yellow portion first to be part of the Lynn Lake uh, Special Service District, and then can we put the others in later another time where be, uh, only because the development hasn't happened yet on the Kmart site and the post office is also kind of being built. So kind of being all that section is kind of starting to be rebuilt. So not necessarily we don't necessarily need to decorate it quite yet since it's not done. So I'm wondering if that process can be delayed a little bit. So a couple more years. Absolutely. Excellent point, Christina. Excellent yeah. point. Yeah. All right. The, the Kmart site is not going to happen overnight. Uh, that's, that was the only question we had on this, just to, other than to let you know that we were going to be re-engaging these property owners. It is not a foregone conclusion that these property owners will say yes. And, and candidly, the, the context for a number of these properties from when we met with them five years ago to now is obviously significantly different. So uh, we, we I want to make sure that everyone here understands the city cannot just cause this to happen. Uh, and a, a, a percentage, it's not 70, but at least 25 uh, property owners representing 25 percent of this lineal frontage need to agree that they want this to happen before it can happen. So um, the. Any other questions on this? Otherwise, we can move on. Um, I mean, so the yellow portion, can that be done first because the uh, city owns the, this, the Kmart site? So would that mean that the percentage of 
um, yays for that would go through quickly? Uh, well, so the unique circumstance here is because the the city owning the Kmart site um, doesn't count because the city doesn't get a, an actual technical vote. So it's up to the other property. The city, the cities can't vote even though it's the property owner because the city's exempt. They don't count towards the the universe of who says yes, and that's true not just on the Kmart site of any city-owned property mm -hmm. in any service district. Oh, so do they pay into it then? The, the, the city opts in to pay for city-owned property, yes. Mm -hmm. So they help okay. participate and bring down the, you know, help pay mm -hmm. their fair share of the cost, okay. but they can't be compelled as a government entity to pay the service charge. So for okay. the purposes of what percentage need to say yes, it's the private property owners only. Okay. I, then I think it's a good time to encourage those property owners on Lake Street to say yes to it, because I think we can, at this time, I think all the ones aligning there would probably really be most likely for it to to make that happen on Lake Street. So could we, could we encourage that now? Uh, well, we're going to go ask the question. Um, and if property owners want to, if you as board members want to reach out to those property owners and say you think it's a good idea, that would certainly be I helpful. agree. But so this is, I want to be clear how this works because some people misunderstand it. This, all we can do is go ask. We can't go, because sometimes, they say, oh, it's the city. They can do whatever they want. The city cannot enlarge this district on its own, unilaterally. Yep. Some percentage of these property owners have to say they want it before the city can do anything. Mm -hmm. And with part of why we wanted to talk to this board today is your leadership as existing board members talking to these property owners, if you know them, would not be a bad idea. Okay. Uh, if you think it, it's something that you would encourage them to support. Got it. And, uh, and, and the stretch underneath that highway it would be nuts not to have that be handled contiguously and uh, otherwise you're going to have homeless encampments underneath that bridge for the in all eternity um it's a complicated you know john just has to ask the question so that is mindot right-of-way with a metro transit bus station they cannot be compelled to pay so the service can be the frontage can be serviced but the rest of the property owners in the district would have to subsidize the service. So it's not a reason it can't be done. Let me be clear. It absolutely services by the district can be provided there. But it wouldn't be paid for by MnDOT. It would not be paid for by MnDOT they, or they have Metro Transit. Do have participation in something like this? What's that? They have no history of participating in something like this? They can't be compelled to participate. No, but they could be asked. They can be asked, yes. They haven't historically, but they can be. Okay. And, and I'm nice saying, I don't want to. Transit station, if you come down from that transit station and nobody's taking care of it, it's nobody's going to want to go there to use the transit station. Don't think you will get an argument out of anybody on the SSD team with that statement. No, but I mean, MnDOT should be common sensed also. We'll talk to Charlie Zell. We'll, we'll see what he says. And is there a special service district on the other side uh, of Lake Street right now? Uh, there, there is not. Um, there has been a multi-year conversation um, about a po the possibility of a district from 35W to Hiawatha. Um, it, um, it's not. It, it's the same situation. Property owners in that area um, where there is no service district need to agree to it. Um, and there needs to be a, a community leadership component of people to say this should happen. Um, and right now that's not there. Um, so there, right now there would not be a district to the east, but there could be at some point. All right. Um, any, that was, uh, so stay tuned again, can't compel it. All we can do is go ask. Um, if folks here want to uh, be part of the outreach process, we're, we're, we're happy to, to to let you know who we've talked to if you want to reach out to them. Um, the um, All right. Um, 
We have no further uh, action items before the group. Is there anything else the group would like to discuss? Otherwise, we can adjourn early. Take it and run. That's never happened. Yeah, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, with that, we will adjourn at 1131. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see you all. Hey, David, where are you? Thank are you. you. In the basement? Uh, no, I'm in Albion, Idaho. Oh, right. wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, between Twin Falls and Boise. Oh, so. cool. Yep. Do a little trip. Uh, by the way, we have about a dozen banners left, so that's what our uh, contractor said. So we'll keep an eye on it. We need more. We, it here? Uh, we went through nine last year. Okay, so. so we got about a year's supply, maybe left. Yep. So okay. We'll be okay. We'll keep okay. Should I send those pictures to someone of the yeah. defense damage? Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have them on your phone David? or on an email? If you have them on an email, send them to the SSD account. Uh, okay. If you have them on your phone, um, you can send them to any of us. Okay. I got them on the phone. Yeah, that works. Um, yeah, email's great. Thank you guys for everything. It's been a yep. pretty good yep. year for Thank special you. services here. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Great. Great. Bye -bye. Thanks, John. Take care. Appreciate it. Thanks. Now I don't have to run to work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Bye.